The conflict in Northern Ireland seemed to be just going on and on in a relentless cycle of violence. And then suddenly in 1981, it took the strangest, darkest, most dramatic twist when Bobby Sands and nine of his young comrades, insisting that they be recognized as political prisoners, went on hunger strike. This was drama at the absolute rawest edge that it could possibly be. Because for everybody, it was like there was this clock ticking in people's heads. There was a sense this wasn't a game. I think it was a very, very difficult process for most people. And if Bobby Sands did nothing else, he broke through the mental partition. I mean, it meant that everybody had to pay attention to it. And I don't think there's anybody on the islands, from whatever perspective, who lived through that time who is not in some way marked by it personally. We interrupt our regular program schedule to bring you the following special report from ABC News Washington. Here is Ted Koppel. Bobby Sands is dead. The 27-year-old member of the Irish Republican Army who went on a protest hunger strike 66 days ago has died. Sands, who was serving a 14-year prison term on a weapons possession charge, had been demanding special status as a political prisoner. A number of other Irish Republican Army members, also imprisoned by the British, have joined Sands in his protest, and several of them are also well into a hunger strike. What he did and what he's known for is the most individual thing anybody could possibly do. What more personal thing could you do than use your own body in the way that he, he did? This is about, you know, the most intimate kind of pain. And yet, very quickly, that intimacy, that personality, that sense of oneself is taken away and is turned into a slogan, a brand. A perfect icon needs to be poised somewhere between knowledge and vast ignorance. And what we get with Sans is we get enough knowledge that we can identify with him as a person, but also you know, he's so young, that there's so little really of his life that you can fill in all those blanks in any way that you want. He was smart. He, he knew himself, of course, that this is what would happen, and perhaps he wouldn't have done it if, if he thought it wouldn't happen, because, of course, he knew that was where the power of it lay. And of course, this is his triumph. This is the artistic triumph to create something that everybody can interpret in whatever way they want in any society at any time. But that's just the way mythology works. I'm standing on the threshold of another trembling world. May God have mercy on my soul.
<laughs> One of the earliest examples of the moral influence of a self-inflicted fast is recorded in the Bible. It's in the book of Jonah where God sent a message to the city of Nineveh to say that he would overthrow it. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. The march through West Belfast was the first major test of public support for this second Republican hunger strike, which has started against a background far more bitter than the first. So far, only one prisoner, Bobby Sands, has refused food, chosen apparently because Sands is felt to be a particularly hard man, ready to face death alone. My heart is very sore because I know that I've broken my poor mother's heart. And my home is struck with unbearable anxiety. But I have considered all the arguments and tried every means to avoid what has become the unavoidable. It has been forced upon me and my comrades by four and a half years of stark inhumanity. I am a political prisoner. I am a political prisoner because I am a casualty of a perennial war that is being fought between the oppressed Irish people and an alien, oppressive, unwanted regime that refuses to withdraw from our land. Thursday football club was several miles from where I was living in Rothcool. We had no proper football team in Rothcool for the size of the state, but that time was supposed to be the biggest in Europe. But there was no organised football team for the kids. To us, it, it wasn't a, a Catholic football club, it wasn't a Protestant, it was a football club. And they looked after one another. And we played at Celtic Park in a cup final, and we beat them five. But when the whistle went, it was like a free throw on the pit. And I remember Sonsy with his boot off, hitting Sonsy over the head with his boot, you know? The start of the sea was something which was genuinely cross me. He didn't know it was cross me. He didn't even think it. Obviously, it had to come apart. It, it couldn't have survived the 70s. It just wasn't going to happen. Gradually, the, the Protestant guys sort of drifted away. People were being drawn back in their two communities at that stage over those years. We had great days, so we had. The troubles then really started happening in Rothcoon. Catholic families were being driven out of their homes. At times where I tried to uh, stick up for families because some of those families were good friends of mine, their sons. And then we seen Bobby Sons forced to leave Rothkill. I have received several notes from my family and friends. I have only read the one from my mother. It was what I needed. She has regained her fighting spirit. I am happy now.
From my earliest years, I recall my mother speaking of the troubled times that occurred during her childhood. Often she spoke of internment on ships, of gun attacks and death, and of early morning raids when one lay listening with pounding heart to the heavy clattering of boots on the cobblestone streets. When the television arrived, my mother's stories were replaced by what it had to offer. I became more confused as the bodies in my mother's tales were also the heroes on TV. The British army always fought for the right side and the police were always the good guys. Then came 1968 and my life began to change. Regularly I noticed the specials attacking and bad and charging the crowds of people who all of a sudden began marching on the streets. I knew that they were our people who were on the receiving end. My sympathies and feelings really became aroused after watching the scenes at Burnt Tollet. That imprinted on my mind like a scar. I became angry. The whole world exploded and my own little world just crumbled around me. The TV did not have to tell the story now, for it was on my own doorstep. Belfast was in flames as our districts, our humble homes were burnt. The specials came at the head of the RUC and the orange hordes right into the heart of our streets, burning, looting, shooting, and murdering. There was no one to save us except the boys, as my father called the men who defended our district with a handful of old guns. The people had risen and were fighting back, and my mother, in her newly found spirit of resistance, hurled encouragement that the TV should and give it to them, boys. At 18 and a half, I joined the Provost, with an M1 carbine and enough heat to topple the world. In many ways, Bobby Sands is not what you expect when you anticipate an IRA background. He's not someone whose family is steeped in it. And I think in some ways that's quite telling and appropriate because many of the people who swelled the ranks of the provost during the 1970s were people who were really not so much products of family tradition as they were products of the escalating violence and intercommunal tensions in Northern Ireland. When he saw that and saw the combination between the kind of violence that was happening on the streets by these kinds of gangs, and also the, the way in which they were more or less being sponsored by the state, then that kind of combination made it political. There were many people who knew him at that time who told me that, you know, we all became political, but we didn't really know why we were political. Fasting in Ireland was rediscovered in the late 19th century by anthropologists who were investigating kind of uh, Gaelic history. And for those scholars who are trying to revive uh, Irish nationalism, there's an emphasis on the ancient Gaelic laws. And it became discovered that there was a kind of almost uh, institutionalized fasting to rectify an injustice. And this became popularized by the uh, play by W.B. Yeats called The King's Threshold. Hunger striking has very ancient roots in Irish history. There was tradition that the poet wasn't paid by the rich man. He would starve himself outside his gate. It struck a chord in Irish history. Particularly from the Fenians onward, hunger striking or forms of protest in jail began to evolve. I'm feeling exceptionally well today. It's only the third day I know, but all the same, I'm feeling great. I had a visit this morning with two reporters. Couldn't quite get my flow of thoughts together. I could have said more in a better fashion. He was being self-deprecating and suggesting that he didn't, uh, that he wasn't satisfied. But that's always the way with artists. Uh, artists are never satisfied with their performance. Hmm.
Firstly, I did not support the armed struggle. I do not agree with violence. I felt an imperative to try and get the prisoners side of the story. I saw my role as a journalist to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. He spoke fluently about how they felt compelled to start this hunger strike. And he made it pretty uh, clear to me that he was likely to die. He talked really in terms of laying down his life for his comrades. And of course, I'm very conscious that his protest was in the tradition of passive resistance, immortalized by Gandhi. Mm -hmm. His most memorable phrase before we parted uh, was, if I die, God will understand. situation in our province would not be tolerated for one second in any other part of the United Kingdom. But our political leaders, they don't know anything about the fear that makes Ulster Protestants tick. They don't know anything about the real deep convictions of the Protestants. There are men in Ulster who will stand to the last man in defense of their heritage. There are men in Ulster who will die rather than pull down the flag. The Protestant reaction was bewilderment at the scale of the IRA uh, violence. That something that had begun as uh, civil rights disturbances and so on, quite quickly, though, became something else. It spawned, of course, a reaction on the Loyalist side who wished to terrorize Catholics. The IRA would uh, rationalize its actions in terms of oppression by the British and so on, and yet, uh, Ordinary Protestants and Unionists were on the on the front line. And one had, had all kinds of, of responses to it, ranging from a kind of cynical understanding, and yet at the same time, a sense of, of, uh, of outrage. We as a government, are concerned with the well-being of all prisoners. We have taken a number of steps to improve the conditions of those held in custody, but we are not prepared to give in to blackmail in the form of a hunger strike or of any other form of pressure. They put a table in my cell and are now placing my food on it in front of my eyes. I honestly couldn't give a damn if they placed it on my knee. They still keep asking me silly questions like, are you still not eating? It is not damaging me, because I think human food can never keep a man alive forever. And I console myself with the fact that I'll get a great feed up above, if I'm worthy. First time, madam was near the end of 1971. There's a family next door was called the Nude family. And the girl called Geraldine was a daughter. And Bobby was seeing her. Uh, quickly grasped me, he was in the rap, no, no one's from Brick. And uh, they always had a lot in common, <laughs> yeah. 
impression I got of Bobby was that he was a bubbly fella. And we used to look like Rod Stewart. He used to have a spiked hair, and so he used to think we called him Rod Stewart, you know, he loved it. He was big hair, like. And then he got caught. Journey came, came into my mother's house, and she said, Bobby was caught with parts of a gun. It was the autumn of 72. I was charged, and for the first time, I faced jail. I had no alternative but to face up to the hardship that lay before me. I ended up sentenced in a barbed wire cage where I spent three and a half years as a prisoner of war with special category status. Throughout the history of the state of the North of Ireland, the British government had been well aware that Irish Republicans believed themselves to be political prisoners. And in 1972, the British government basically conceded political status, although they preferred to call it special category status, and there was peace in the prisons. It gave the prisoners certain privileges. They didn't have to work, they wore their own clothes and received regular parcels, visits and letters. But there was nothing to say that they should live in POW compounds with their military structures intact. That came about because there was no alternative. At the time, the jails were full. So inside the compounds, you're dealing with, a, with an army? Yes. The huts were locked up at 9 o'clock at night. They were unlocked at half 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. But basically, you had control over your own day. So we got our time in by developing our own real sense of the type of Ireland that we wish to see. And people look back on it now, they call Longcast University and Freedom. Here was this place where you're listening to other people explaining why you were there. It was there the first time I met people like Bobby Sands and people like that. And during the debates, we would start uh, looking at other struggles and similarities and trying to find out what it, it was that would take our own struggle that stage further. It was a very revolutionary period. We had a vast library, all political theories, from Stalin to Churchill, to Mao Zedong, to Ho Chi Minh. You want a better understanding of what, what's happening here? There you go, read that. That's whenever I seen the like of Sands himself, who would have been developing at a very, very sharp rate. You could see there, he used to write down his own ideas. He became more intense and more structured in his, uh, his development. A key thing that happened at that point in time as well was when Jerry Adams came into the area known as Cage 11. In Cage 11, I mean, there was this new recombination of politics where, where Adams was saying, well, OK, guys, we learned about Marx, we learned about Mao, we've learned about Che. But, you know, what about our own people? And he begins to get them to think about the kinds of things that Connolly wrote about, that Liam Mellows wrote about. Well, I, I met Bobby, must have been around 1976 or 77. I'd say he was quite modest, but, but, but very intense. He was deeply troubled and challenged by the sectarian nature of our society. He went back to reading Jimmy Hope. He went back to reading Miriam McCracken. He went back to reading uh, Wolf Tone. But, you know, the sense of citizenship, of communities need to be empowered. And how could you develop in your own neighborhood or your own community a Republican ethos?
I was lonely for a while this evening, listening to the crow's call as they returned home. Should I hear the beautiful lark, she would rant my heart. Now as I write, the old curlew mournfully calls as they fly over. I like the birds. Well, I must leave off, for if I write more about the birds, my tears will fall and my thoughts return to the days of my youth. Those were the days, and gone forever now. Between 1917 and 1923, there were at least 10,000 hunger strikes by Irish Republicans. The Irish Republicans were borrowing a tactic that had been pioneered by an English woman in 1909. She was a suffragette who was fighting for the votes for women. And her hunger strike showed just how effective this tactic could be when fighting against the Westminster government. Sweeney, of course, being a Lord Mayor, and this extraordinary form of protest, even after a world war, it caught the imagination. And particularly revolutionary-minded people of the world saw this. One of the students at the time in, in London was Ho Chi Minh. And he was very impressed by McSweeney and by the Irish struggle generally. McSweeney said, it is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can suffer the most who will win. Which is a very striking and radical thought. The whole tradition of, of, of military conflict is, you've got to inflict more suffering on the other guy in order to win the war. And what McSweeney had said was, actually, you know, by suffering, but by suffering publicly and over a long period of time, you are making a statement. And you're making a statement which was, you will outlast the others. No matter what they do to you, you will still be there, or your spirit will still be there, or the people who will follow you will still be there. And in the end, you will win. I have poems in my mind. Mediocre, no doubt. Poems of hunger strike and McSweeney. And everything that this hunger strike has stirred up in my heart and in my mind. Frank has now joined me on the hunger strike. I have the greatest respect, admiration and confidence in Frank. And I know that I am not alone. Now and again, I am struck by the natural desire to eat. But the desire to see an end to my comrades' plight and the liberation of my people is overwhelmingly greater. They will not criminalize us, rob us of our true identity, depoliticize us. Never will they label our liberation struggle as criminal. Well, when he came out of jail in 1976, I think it was, he came down to the Republican Press Center on Falls Road, where I was the editor of Republican News. He was setting up a tennis association in Twinbrook and also wanted to produce a community newspaper. 
Uh, I realized that he here was somebody who was quite progressive, articulate, left wing, and really interested in his community. Bobby had been released a number of weeks before me. And he talked about broadening the struggle to in involve our community much more in the resistance to the British. One of the sort of lessons that we brought out of Long Cash was that if you have an active service unit in an area, if the British manage to take them out, that kills the Republican presence. Whereas if you can build different levels of Republican resistance, from a youth movement to a women's movement to a community, if you, if you build all these structures, well then, if the active service unit does fall, it means that they're not leaving a vacuum. So we understood the, the theory of revolutionary warfare and, and that's the way we came at it. Many prisoners, they come out of prison and they've been reading Che, they've been reading Ho Chi Minh, and basically they're, they're saying that this is what we need to be doing, is being like Ho or, or Che. But Bobby wasn't like that. What Bobby began to think was we have British imperialism all around us. We don't wait until we send the British army out of Ireland. What we do now is we begin to build the kind of society we want. I remember trying to say to him, just settle yourself down. You have a wife and child. Try and establish some sort of a relationship and get yourself into some sort of a stable environment. He was married while he was in prison. So the, the fact of having a wife and having, having a child and having to support all that was very new to Bobby, which meant that he always had the, the tension of an activist and a father. Then Geraldine got pregnant. She wanted Bobby to spend more time in the house. She wanted Bobby to pay more attention to her. You were committed to the, the armed struggle and committed to the, your comrades and your personal relationships took second place. As happened in hundreds of cases, it just didn't work out for them. Bombers had attacked a warehouse in Belfast. As the police moved in, there was a gun battle. Mr. Sands was charged with possession of a gun nearby. At his trial, although he couldn't be connected with the bombing, he was given 14 years. The government ruled on March the 1st that terrorists convicted of crimes committed after that date would no longer get special category status, but must wear prison uniform just like ordinary criminals. Well, for one thing, it would be entirely against the spirit of national law to say that because you commit an appalling crime like murder or bombing innocent people for political motives that you should be regarded as having a right to a particular status that anybody who was arrested after midnight on the 1st of March, 1976, would be a criminal. And, but if you were arrested with a nuclear bomb at 5 to 12, you were political. It was absurd. 
they had special interrogation centres, special courts, and they built a special jail, the Hates Blocks of Long Cash. This is a normal prison, not a prisoner of war camp. Here, the prison officers are in control. The facilities are excellent. Trades and skills are taught to persuade the inmates that there is more to life than shooting and bombing. So they didn't conform. They wanted their compounds, they wanted freedom of association, and above all, they weren't allowed to wear their own clothes. That was the spark that lit the fuse. What they didn't uh, calculate, and none of us could have, because there, there, was, there, there was no Republican plan, uh, was Kieran Nugent. They said, right, take our clothes off and put this uniform on. He said that uh, the only way that they would get him to wear the uniform is if they nailed it to his back. At that, he lifted a blanket, wrapped it around himself, and the, the blanket protest was born. The administration took away their clothes, took away their beds, took away lockers, took away books, radios, toothbrushes, blocked up their windows, wouldn't give them exercise, wouldn't let them have weekly visits. You have to remember that the situation in the jails was like a pressure cooker. It was boiling up. So the prisoners would tell you the warders began kicking over the commodes. Then they, in retaliation, began throwing the feces out the window. And the warders apparently began throwing it back in again. So there was no place else to put it except on the walls. Literally, the most fundamental method of warfare ever was carried on in the jails. At the start, it was indescribably horrible. There was the excretion on the walls, there was the urine being thrown out every night and getting washed back in again. You were lying on a mattress on the floor, which was getting smaller because you were pulling bits of the mattress off to smear your excretion on the walls. But after a month or so, it became just a, a normal way of living. When one spends each day naked and crouching in the corner of a cell resembling a pigsty, staring at such eyesores as piles of putrefying rubbish, infested with maggots and flies, a disease-ridden chamber pot or a blank, disgusting, scarred wall, it is to the rescue of one's sanity to be able to rise and gaze out of a window at the world. Today, the screws began blocking up all the windows with sheets of steel. To me, this represents the further torture of the tortured, blocking out the very essence of life, nature. Here, my torturers have long ago started and still endeavor to block up the window on my mind. It was very hostile. You couldn't ask for a more hostile environment. We were working in an open sewer with 40 people who wanted to kill us. And basically, that's what it is. You 40 people down there who wanted you dead. You were reasonably safe in work, but then you were driving home. You didn't know what was meeting you there, which happened quite a lot. Knock on the door. Nine mil in the head. The provisional IRA gunned down in his own doorstep Albert Miles, the deputy governor of the Mays prison. This killing was followed by the murder of a prisoner. Between 1979 and 1982, there was 14 prison officers murdered. There was 10 on murdered in one year. They were sending letter bombs to our houses. They were addressing them to their wives. They were putting plastic boxes onto the cars. They didn't care who was driving the car. They didn't care whether you were taking your kids to school. They didn't give a toss, so why should I give a toss about them? But everybody wanted these people locked up. That's okay, and I said to people, lock them up, throw away the key, but somebody has to unlock that door. And I'm the poor sucker that had to open the door.
The British government have said they won't concede political status, and the prisoners in their statement today have repeated their intention of fasting to the death in order to obtain it. If Bobby Sands continues his fast, then the crisis in this hunger strike will come around Easter. Foremost in my tortured mind is the thought that there can never be peace in Ireland until the foreign, oppressive British presence is removed, leaving all the Irish people as a unit to control their own affairs and determine their own destinies as a sovereign people. The connecting link with drawing people into the physical force movement in Irish history is the British uniform. And as long as there's a British uniform in Ireland, there's going to be a, a grit in the oyster, the political oyster, around which no pearl will form. And there is a tradition in republicanism of arising in every generation, no matter how hopeless. I was very much to the fore in 1916. They hadn't a hope of winning, and they knew it, but they did it. In 1916, to Republicans, is a bit like high mass. It was the executions and the creation of martyrs that changed in 1916 into a right-angle turning point in Ireland. It changed it to uh, the willingness to endure. Bobby Sands was deeply aware of the fact that he wasn't just this isolated individual at a particular point in time. He very consciously saw himself in a tradition which was the 1916 tradition. The only way we can win is emotional and metaphorical, and we can win by sacrifice. So he knows enough about the culture that he comes from to know that this is going to hit certain nerve endings within the collective psyche. It's going to connect with Irish republicanism and its martyr traditions, but it's also going to connect with Catholicism. It's going to connect with the idea of, of Christ. Protestants would have found incomprehensible that notion that young men could contemplate starving themselves to death for what were quite modest political aims. But in fact, those modest quantifiable demands were actually enveloped by the much bigger demand uh, that Irish republicanism requires of its, of its uh, participants. It is the declared wish of these people to see humane and better conditions in these blocks. But the issue at stake is not humanitarian. It is purely political and only a political solution will solve it. We wish to be treated not as ordinary prisoners, for we are not criminals. We admit no crime unless the love of one's people and country is a crime. Discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. Well, quite clearly, the election of Margaret Thatcher by an extraordinary majority was an enormous achievement. And uh, we all knew that British politics was not going to be the same again, that many things were going to change in the field of industry, of industrial relations, and of course, we had the problems of uh, Northern Ireland. 
her views on Northern Ireland were mainstream unionist views, a sort of general feeling that people who want to be British should be, and they should be defended. And above all, the thing which excited her deepest emotion was support for the armed forces and the police, and the idea that they were being targeted and killed uh, by enemies of Britain was abhorrent to her. She understood that there were injustices to the nationalist population, but she didn't equate Irish republicanism with the nationalist population. It wasn't, they're Irish, who cares? It was, these are terrorists trying to undermine uh, the rule of law, and with that, there should be no compromise. And we knew that particularly, of course, because on the eve of the election, Airy Neve, who would have been her Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, had been murdered by Irish Republicans. So we knew times were not going to be easy. Well, I have gotten by 27 years. So that is something. I may die, but the Republic of 1916 will never die. Onward to the Republic and liberation of our people. The only sort of solace that we had was whenever the prison warders left and the night guard came on. And round about nine o'clock or so, you would settle down for the sort of evening matinee. We'd have got, maybe put the mattress up towards the door and the mattress itself could have been absolutely soaking wet with urine and water that screws maybe had hosed us down in the cells and stuff. But you made yourself as comfortable as possible and everybody just got their ears chinned up to the wee, the hinge at the door, and then Bobby, he would get up, and then, right, lads, tonight we're doing such and such a story. You know, someone would know a book inside out and would, over a period of nights, chapter by chapter, relate it out the door. There, there's one famous one that Bobby did himself. It was over a 10-night period, and it was called Jet. And it was about... Uh, this kid who was drafted into the American army during the Vietnam War. You know, you can see this character rejecting his, his whole father's father, apparently was a colonel or something. It was the family tradition to, to go in. That he was objecting to American troops being in Vietnam. Fascinating story, chapter by chapter. And, uh, you could be in the jungle in Vietnam, like with this guy. And he just says, to hell with that. And he jumped on his Harley Davidson, he had long hair, and he just hit the road. And you know what? We were all on that Harley. Every one of us. And in the darkness, he really took us all out of Long Cash. And you closed your eyes and you were there. There was always that moral edge to it about good overcoming evil and about how um, you would always win out in the end. I, I remember talking to one of the, the guys that was there. He says, you know, we'll never live in a situation like that again. You know, it was the closest thing to communism Anybody would do anything for, for each other, he says. It, it was really the greatest thing that we'll ever experience. And then in the next sentence, he said, it was pure hell. Once we came out of 78 towards the end of 79, we realized that the No Wise protest, it wasn't enough to break the will of the Brits to negotiate for some sort of settlement. So in the middle of 1979, the, the idea of hunger strike was broached. We targeted late September as the date. We asked for volunteers around the blocks uh, for people, and the names came flooding in.
seven convicted IRA terrorists of the Mays prison in Northern Ireland began their threatened hunger strike this morning. And later, another 142 men joined the existing so-called dirty no-wash protest. This means that nearly half the prisoners here live in conditions of self-imposed filth. And the decision of seven men to go on hunger strike is seen as a last-ditch attempt to gain political status for these men. Bobby Sands was livid that he wasn't on it. The argument was that you can't put everybody on this. And they said to Bobby Sands, you're taking over as OC. That's it. A year ago, only the relatives and a few hundred Republican diehards could be expected to turn up at an H-block rally. Now, under a constant barrage of propaganda, there are several thousands. The British knew that they were in a struggle, they were in a battle here because in the terms of hearts and minds, they were losing this campaign. At the beginning of the hunger strike, they underestimated the determination of Miss Thatcher. Here was a, a prime minister under, under massive pressure. The economy was tanking at the time. There was mass unemployment. So the impression was here was somebody who could be broken. But what boxed her in was that she inherited this policy. She inherited this policy from the Labour government. It was the Labour government who ended uh, special category status. And once you inherit that policy, you couldn't back down. Immorally, the hunger strike was very simple in her mind. These people had committed these crimes and they should be punished for them and they should have no special rights. And the hunger strike was a way of blackmailing her so it was a sort of completely unacceptable form of leverage. After 54 days, with one of the strikers close to death, the IRA's commanding officer in the H blocks, Brendan Hughes, took the decision to call off the hunger strike. The prisoners believed through intermediaries that the British government was about to make concessions. But they misread the signals. It quickly became apparent that they had no deal. And the arrangement was that Breton wasn't to call off the hunger strike without consulting Bobby Sands. Because Bobby was the OC of the president, he had succeeded Breton. Bobby me was one of the boys, you know, which is why when he was made OC, and we're thinking, Bobby, you know, he's a nice guy and he's talented and all the rest of it. But to me, the most fascinating thing is, is how the person in a moment becomes a leader in all intents and purposes and says to Brandon, he fucked up. I think, in the end, they realised that the government was simply not going to give them what they'd been demanding, and that, therefore, they had the choice either of dying or of living. As soon as the strike ended, one of the problems that Bobby Sands had as officer commanding was the morale of the prisoners. So it was a, an absolute period of crisis in trying to keep the, the, the protest going after so many years. And then he realized, you know, that what happened in the jail was important for what was happening on the outside. Bobby immediately said, uh, there's only one thing for it. We're going back on hunger strike. The leadership sent in word, under no circumstances will we sanction a second hunger strike. And Bobby fought with them. And in the end, he said, look, you either sack me or back me. Some people, I think, referred to it as a kind of a tunnel vision, you know, that Bobby, at this point, became so concentrated on this one thing. This is something that we can't even understand unless we see it in the context of the whole group. They weren't just facing the world alone, but they were facing this future as a collectivity. And the sole criteria for getting on the second hunger strike was, would you be willing to die? Because if you don't die, this is going to hurt the rest of us. And Bobby said, that's the reason I'm going on first is because I will die.
he has, first of all, a certain sense of guilt. Uh, people like McSweeney had a sense of guilt that they hadn't taken part in the 1916 Rising, for example. And therefore, when the opportunity came to do something, they felt this extra burden, you know, that they had to take it on themselves. And I think Bobby Sands maybe felt after the first failed hunger strike, and him having been the OC, felt this sense of duty. And he comes across, this is what moving, I think, is he comes across as a very young man. And with all of the sort of intact idealism that the young can have, he sees his own actions as being moral actions, as being good and righteous. That's why he's challenging, I think, particularly for people who don't agree with him, don't agree with where he's coming from. You still can't deny from the writings the sort of the sincerity. This guy, you get a sense when you read him, is absolutely conscious of his place in history, but he's not indulging it. It's not as if he's driven by a megalomaniacal idea that, you know, I'm gonna be this godlike figure. You really don't get that from his writings. What you get from his writings is a very old fashioned, almost Victorian sense of duty. I have always taken a lesson from something that was told to me by a sound man. That is, that everyone, Republican or other ways, has his own particular part to play. No part is too great or too small. No one is too old or too young to do something. So, Mukhara, for what it's worth, I would like to thank you all for what you have done. And I hope many others follow your example. And I'm deeply proud to have known you all, and prouder still to call you comrades and friends. Just a normal day. I opened the cell, prisoner said to me, I'm refusing food. Okay, no problem. Then on, food was left in the cell. There's two scoops of potato, fish, one ladle full of peas, two slices of bread with butter and tea. Well, it's like I said to them, I'm putting the food into you. You don't want to eat it, that's up to you. We'll put the food in, we'll take the food out. And we'll do that three times a day. And that was their choice. They wanted to commit suicide. That was their choice. Tonight's tea was pie and beans. And although hunger may fuel my imagination, I don't exaggerate, the beans were nearly falling off the plate. If I said this all the time to the lads, they would worry about me. But I'm all right. An adult who's in good health should be able to stand 28 days of total fasting without major complications. Maybe sometimes when you, when you get up, you fall over, it's called, uh, you have hypotension, your, your blood pressure goes down, but there's nothing which really uh, stops you from uh, thinking normally. It's after 28 days that, that things start getting bad. Extreme dizziness comes and uh, confusion and uh, the person feels very cold because of course uh, the, the metabolism of the body tends to go down and therefore you, you feel more cold than, than you should. And there's many other complications, uh, including visual factors, which begin to, to, to kick in. And all these minor factors which can become more and more major as the, as the time advances. And it's in the middle of the second month that things really get bad.
welcome to the Northern Ireland Regional Final of the Trust House 40 World Freestyle Dancing Championships. Tonight, our 12 finalists come from all points of the province. In our cabaret spot tonight, Francis Marion and Maxi, better known to you as Sheba. And so, without further to do, finalists, let's get dancing! One of the big difficulties that the uh, support movement for the prisoners on the inside faced was a lack of publicity. There was practically no publicity in advance of its starting and practically no publicity while the hunger strike was unfolding and Bobby Sands was leading it. There had been so much attention given to the first one that the, the view from the leadership outside was it would be difficult to attain the same level of mobilisation out of the fact that it didn't work. The first few weeks was pretty flat in terms of protest on the streets. The Frank McGuire thing was the catalyst. Frank McGuire, who had been the MP for Fermanagh South Throne, about two weeks into Bobby's hunger strike, Frank McGuire collapsed and died of a heart attack. I immediately thought to myself, if it was possible, and if there was a by-election, we should put Bobby Sands' name forward to stand in Fermanagh South Turtle. We had major worries about it, of course. First of all, we would have to get the agreement of Bobby Sands, and even if Bobby lost by one vote, Thatcher would have crowed, even your own people rejected you. Within the provisional Republican movement, there had been a deep scepticism about electoral politics because there was a notion that the North was a place in which the electoral maths was against you by design. So when you put someone up for election to the House of Commons, this in itself is a change of approach of a dramatic kind. But it was a risk because it was breaking with the instincts of provisional Republicanism, which had been hostile towards the compromises which they saw as being involved in electoral politics. At the time, I think people saw it as uh, a, a, a politicization of the hunger strike itself. And some people saw that as a great thing, as a way of kind of democratizing that struggle. And some people saw it as a cynical move. So this was Sinn Féin trying to take advantage of this extraordinary situation that was going on within the prison. My body is broken and cold. I'm lonely and I need comfort. From somewhere afar, I hear those familiar voices which keep me going. We're with you, son. We're with you. I went in to get him to sign papers. Well, at the time, I was only, what, 26, 27, and obviously didn't realize uh, what maybe I was getting into. But, uh, however, I, I, I naively said to him, I remember, and he was a bit offended, I naively said to him, because I, I said, if you ever think of changing your mind about this, tell me, you know, and, I, and he, he says, Abs there's, Abs that doesn't arise at all. I noticed that the, his dinner was sitting on the, on the tray. I did obviously realise that this was a very serious place and that this man uh, meant business, you know. And he did say to me that he said that he would die. He says, I, he says, I know that I will, I will die. Well, hunger strikes are a peculiarly modern tactic, and they fit in two ways with developments in the contemporary world, one of which is, of course, the power of the media which means that somebody suffering in one place in the world can be accessible to everybody in the world. So states become more and more reluctant to create uh, victims or create martyrs, at least uh, publicly. And so therefore, if the state is not going to create martyrs, then people will have to make martyrs of themselves. So in 1963, we saw the incredibly potent image of the Buddhist monk from South Vietnam who set himself on fire. And that became an image that was uh, beamed around the world and became crucial in undermining the American regime uh, in South Vietnam. And that's an example of the kind of power of self-inflicted suffering to move people, even people who have no connection with the struggle. So 
So we were very conscious if we were to achieve anything within our own publicity, that the imagery of our prisoners, you know, we had to humanize them. Bobby had went into prison very early, so there wasn't really any great photographs of him. Um, I remember that there was what we had taken, lots of ones when we were in the prison. That particular one was Tomboy, myself, Bobby, and Dennis. We had made uh, home brew and we were drinking, and I don't know where the camera came from. I still don't know where it came from or who owned it, and the photo was taken. The image doesn't give you any deep reading of the expression or of that person. So the sort of ambiguity of the image itself is crucial to the projection of martyrdom onto the figure. And it's really this kind of dialogue between the image and the viewer the viewer thinking of the suffering or, or the kind of other worldliness of what they've done. And images have a certain impact or a certain potency, you could say. But it takes events outside of the image to create the full kind of fusion, if you like, of that iconography. After the First World War, Churchill wrote that entire countries had been swept away, but the dreary spires of Fermanagh and Tyrone still stood intact. There are 5,000 more nationalist voters than unionist ones here, and only the unwillingness to elect an IRA man will cut into that. Well, it's a terrible choice between a provisional IRA man on one hand um, and a reactionary discredited unionist. So it is um, an acute dilemma for a large number of Catholics in the constituents. They haven't seen the light of day, but us, the people, will let them see the light of day. People are not being asked to come out and make any decision in opposition to or in favour of violence, armed struggle or anything else. Bobby Sands is the single anti-unionist candidate in this election, standing on a single issue. A lot of what Bobby Sands was doing, in a way, was taking one truth and making a different truth. The truth he was taking was the truth that actually the IRA was not suffering. The IRA was not a victim. In, in the Troubles. The vast majority of IRA killings were pretty safe for the killer. Their classic weapon was the car bomb. You set the bomb, you walked away from the carnage, you were safe. You walked up to somebody's door, you knocked on the door, you shot somebody in the head, you ran away. You placed a mine on a road when a British Army convoy was coming along and you did it by remote control. And remote control is not the warrior's honor. And what the hunger strikes did partly for the IRA, I think, was reverse that truth. And they couldn't do their courage in the usual way that soldiers do. So how could you do it? You, you could do it by dying. Here was someone on their behalf almost who was saying, I will show exemplary courage and therefore somehow change in people's heads the idea of what this movement is about. He was only a child in 68 when the civil rights movement started. So Bobby Sands... But the IRA really didn't understand what Bobby Sands was doing. What does the IRA go and do? Right in the heart of the election campaign, they murder, in the most grotesque way, Joanne Mathers, mother of two, for the awful crime of collecting census forms. So they're saying, actually, you know what? It still is about killing and we're going to keep doing it. And for the voters in Fermanagh South Tyrone, you have this awful dilemma. What are they actually voting for? Mm -hmm. 
John Mathers is buried on the day of the election result. So are they voting compassionately to save a life? Or are they voting for an organization which is in the business of taking life? The count took place in the Technical College in Enniskillen. I've never seen so many cameramen press from Radio Moscow, Radio Prague, Australia, Japan, all there because they saw this, I think, in terms of David versus Goliath. There was Bobby Sands, there was Thatcher. Sands, Bobby, anti-H block, Armagh, political prisoner, 30,000... Yeah! 492. West, Henry W., Ulster Unionist, 29,046. And I declare that Bobby Sands has been duly elected to serve as a member for the third constituency. Can I always remember the smile on his mother and his uh, sister's face? I presume they would have believed and hoped, of course, that it would have saved his life. I went in to see him the next day, and, and, and he, he was pleased. But he said to me, he says, it, it makes no difference. He said, it'll make no difference to me. He knew. He seemed to have it worked out, you know. It's a tremendous boost for the Itch Block campaign, but it's bound to be regarded throughout the world as much more than that, as a victory for the IRA. Sands' election to Parliament embarrassed the British and it has made Sands more than the folk hero he had already become. This 11-year-old boy sitting on the debris of a recent riot says Sands is dying for him. You are to destruction. You are required to despair. I have no doubts or regrets about what I am doing, for I know what I have faced for eight years, and in particular for the last four and a half years, others will face. All men must have hope and never lose heart. But my hope lies in the ultimate victory for my poor people. Is there any hope greater than that? England was the big fish in a small pool. And then suddenly, the big whale of America swims in. If America gets involved, everything changes. The political prisoners, whether the British say they are or not, and let's pray for a united Ireland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are screaming that the British government has to end the war. I believe that the solution was getting America involved. The more people who put pressure on the American government to do something, the better. Whereas the Irish embassy was hand in glove with the British Embassy not wanting anything done about the hunger strike. And they were telling their embassy in Washington, do not agitate Irish Americans. Because if Irish Americans get very agitated, they're going to know that the Dublin government is doing nothing. So keep things quiet because Sands and the others we want really to crush them, and we want to marginalize their movement. It was a difficult one to explain to an Irish American audience. This is being used to whip up support for a violent movement. But when you're conveying a complex message against the provost, simple message, Brits out, our job was not easy.
here we were in America at the time, and, and the narrative that we had come to accept about the troubles in Northern Ireland was a romantic group of victims that when they went to the streets, they were doing it out of a sense of uh, pride and, 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 and desperation. It was a romanticized version of the problem. And in comes this character named Bobby Sands. And what he did, it was a brilliant political move. There was a sense here of people ready to transcend the past. There were voices, including most prominently Senator Kennedy's, that found a way of saying, we must help the British appreciate that they should meet the conditions Bobby and the other hunger strikers had set forth. And I think something we didn't quite appreciate was just how stubborn the British could be, even against their own interests. Oh, no. I mean, nobody would suggest for a moment, would they, that an MP who commits an offense and is sentenced to prison should be treated differently from anybody else. I'm not suggesting it. I don't think anybody else is either. That's where the diplomatic effort comes in. They have to up their counter-propaganda efforts. And it is counter-propaganda. It is about an image of what you're trying to project to the world. Sinn Féin rejected the British Parliament anyway, so it was a sort of publicity stunt, but it was a publicity stunt with the power of votes. And uh, that was alarming. Mrs Thatcher was very conscious of the propaganda battle in Washington, uh, and she fought it back. Irish Americans, including Teddy Kennedy, God bless them, were scared off because criticize the British and you'll be seen as supporting the IRA. And that was the simple tactic of both the British and Irish embassy, and it worked. While we might ask the American administration to ask Thatcher to soften her stance, we were not going to ask them to intervene in an active sense in the affairs of another country. They had larger concerns involving the IRA as a troublesome element and, and a criminal element in many eyes. And I think that just trumped the issue. But of course, not that long after the start of the hunger strike, President Reagan is shot. He's out of action for about 10 days in the hospital. And we were about to uh, break diplomatic relationships with Libya on the issue of terrorism. At the end of the day, the view of the White House was that while, in a sense, you could say that a man like uh, Bobby Sands was a prisoner of conscience, that cause and that organization is also a terrorist organization. I was thinking today about the hunger strike. People say a lot about the body, but don't trust it. I consider that there is a kind of fate indeed. Firstly, the body doesn't accept the lack of food. And it suffers from the temptation of food. The body fights back, sure enough. But at the end of the day, everything returns to the primary consideration. That is, the mind. So loss of weight the first month is, is gradual, and it's uh, not as uh, catastrophic as one would imagine. And during that month, uh, the body is not yet digesting itself. It's not the weight change which radically changes, it's the effects of the whole fasting which kicks in. Between 35 and 45 days, it's what the chief medical officer told me, what he called the oculomotor phase. The muscles in your eyes don't work as well as they should, and uh, you get nystagmus, you get these rapid eye movements, which are uncontrollable. It's extremely unpleasant, it causes vomiting, and it was the phase that hunger strikers who were beginning the strike feared the most. After day 45, all of a sudden, the vertigo stops. After the vertigo ends, the person can comprehend everything and can make a rational decision. But this is not gonna last very long. And you have this entity called anosognosia, which means the person does no longer realize what exactly, how serious the situation is. She's 
could very quickly see on the streets of Dublin, the streets of Cork, that the emotional power of it was beginning to draw in people who had not previously been involved in Republican politics and had probably not even been involved in politics at all. And that's what terrified the southern governments. I mean, they were really very, very scared by this. You've got to remember, in the Republic, most people didn't want to know about the North. You know, they had been psychologically prepared to, you know, wake up in the morning and hear the latest atrocity and then try to get on with the rest of the day without paying any attention to it. There was this terror that the, the troubles were going to spill across the border. But Fianna Fáil, who was, which was the dominant political party in the South, was particularly sensitive to this because it had put itself forward as being the real Republican Party on the islands of Ireland. In my view, a declaration by the British government of their interest in encouraging the unity of Ireland by agreement and in peace. And then, with the hunger strikes, you had Sinn Féin and the IRA making a, a really vivid claim to say, you're not the Republicans, we are the Republicans. You can pull up your rhetoric, we can pull up the bodies of starving men. I'm continually, I'm still very deeply concerned and anxious about the hate block situation. And uh, the British government fully understand that concern. An election is pending, that is what worries Mr. Hockey, that he's going to lose power. The electoral arithmetic is very tight, and any growth in support for H-Block supporters could be translated into elections to the Doyle. And you see an increasing number of desperate attempts to try and produce some sort of initiative, anything. Mr Bobby Sands, the IRA hunger striker, has been given the last rites by a Roman Catholic priest in the hospital at the Mays Prison near Belfast. The Northern Ireland office has granted his request for a special visit from the Dublin MPs, Sheila de Valera, Neil Blaney and John O'Connell, in the hope that they can persuade him to give up his seven-week fast. It was a very, obviously, emotional meeting. Dr John O'Connell, who was his health minister, he said to Neil Blaney, he says, I'm going to ask him to take him off. And Blaney says, don't, he can't do that. Well, he says, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm a half to He says. He was very ill. He was blind in one eye because I always remember him rubbing his eye and Sheila de Valera was crying. O'Connell pressed uh, Bobby to come off, but he, he, a man, he said he, he wasn't, and he told him about all the suffering that they'd done in the H-Box. And, well, and that only uh, exacerbated the situation with Sheila de Valera because she was actually crying into an awful state then because when she heard all that was going on, you know. I found that I could not persuade him. I, I emphasised how important his own life was. I didn't think a life was worth that. But he was very determined, and I got the impression he was fully resigned to die. I, I saw in this man more determination than I've ever seen in any person before. He now weighs 47 kilograms. He cannot read, and he cannot focus his eyesight, and believes he is going blind. He himself thinks he has possibly three or four days left to live. There can be no possible concessions on political status. To do that, in fact, would put many, many people into jeopardy. Everyone said that a crime which you and I regard as a crime, describe as a crime and which is a crime, if ever there was an attempt to say it is not a crime, it's political, then everyone, I'm afraid, would go in fear. The prisoners are clearly recognised as political prisoners. It's stupid of Mrs Thatcher, and it's idiotic of her to turn around and say, a crime is a crime is a crime. When you have both protagonists taking public stances, what is lacking is trust. The government's position is there will be no negotiations before the end of the strike. Of course, the prisoners didn't believe them. And neither side wants to lose face. And that's the tragedy of it.
The IRA's Bobby Sands, nearly blind and close to death, today refused to meet with two human rights mediators who went to May's prison to try to persuade Sands to end his hunger strike. The authorities would not agree to Mr. Sands' conditions that his friends would be with him when he met the delegation and the commissioners will not now be taking up his case. Outside the prison, a group of loyalist protesters angrily put the point that the people in real need of human rights justice were those who'd suffered as a result of IRA killings. Well, Bobby Sands is putting on a performance for the world. He is trying to get the maximum publicity possible uh, for his cause. That is the cause that has murdered people, that has murdered children in my constituency. That's the cause that Bobby Sands represents. The Protestants are delighted that Sands chose not to let the Human Rights Commission intervene to stop the hunger strike. And ironically, many Irish Republican sympathizers are also happy that apparently Sands still chooses death. One said the IRA needs a martyr, and Sands is a good one. It's been some time since Republican sympathizers marched through Belfast with quite this degree of support and this degree of emotional intensity. And it took place in a mood of bitterness and confusion generated by the breakdown of the mediation effort by the Human Rights Commissioners. The Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Hawkey, came in for as much hostility from the marchers as Mrs. Thatcher. We were helpless in terms of getting the administration to intervene. Ed Meese at that stage was his chief of staff. So I went to see Meese and he started the conversation by telling me that we've had to deal with difficult prison situations in California. Dealing with prisoners, they only understand one thing, and that's toughness. So I'm not going to advise the president to phone the British prime minister to dilute her toughness, but it was a gift to the provost. Sands was a player in a, in a, in a tragic drama. And like Hamlet was trying to be the playwright and the author of his own destiny. But in fact, Bobby Sands and the Hunger Strikers were enacting a script that in a sense had already been written. The script had been written by Terence McSweeney. It had been written by Patrick Pierce. It was the triumph of, of fear. Bobby Sands was reported closer to death today. The Tension increased throughout and Belfast, and there was more violence. At the Vatican, Pope John Paul begged the world. Bobby Sands, leur député, qui en est dit-on. In a sense, what happened to Bobby Sands in that period was he stopped being a soldier and he became an artist. And by showing that your body can take this extraordinary amount of punishment, and that you will do this willingly, that you will sacrifice yourself in this way. You take the moral high ground, you take the imaginative high ground, you get into people's heads. I believe I am but another of those wretched Irishmen born of a risen generation, with a deeply rooted and unquenchable desire for freedom. I may be a sinner, but I stand. And if it so be, you will die. Happy knowing that I do not have to answer for what these people have done to our ancient nation. I was uh, in the prison hospital. The door was slightly ajar, and when I opened it, the scene that the greeted my eyes, I couldn't believe. He was lying on his back. There was a cage. The blankets were, were, were covering the cage which, because they couldn't touch his body. And he said, who's that? And I said, it's Jim Bobby. He said, I can't see you, I'm blind. <sighs> he reached out his hand. We touched, we 
we said goodbye. And he said, tell the lads I'm hanging in. This is the last visit you'll have with him. That's Did right. you say goodbye to Bobby? Yeah, we said goodbye. And he, ju he just asked me, was there any change? And I told him there wasn't, you know. And he just said, that's it. And he says, you know, he says, look after me, ma. Go and see me, ma. So. I would like to appeal to the people for to remain calm and to have no fighting or cause no death or destruction. My son has offered his life for better conditions in prison, but not to cause further death outside. That's all I can say. How is it today? Next time. I can hear the curly passing overhead. Such a lonely cell. Such a lonely struggle. This road is well trod, and he, whoever he was, who first passed this way, deserves the salute of the nation. I am but a mere follower, and I must say, Ihuahi, good night. Bobby Sands' death by hunger strike guarantees him a place in the Republican pantheon, an assured estimation as an IRA martyr, and one of a small but select group whose self-inflicted deaths have punctuated Irish history during the 20th century. Now, it's too soon to say, and no one knows. Sands it was actually home when the word came through, and it was weird because no one spoke. <laughs> and, uh, weird. They just walked out on the street. And someone started singing Faith of Our Fathers. And as they walked around this neighborhood, it was one of the most spiritual experiences ever. Bearing in mind that Bobby had gone, it was almost as if, like, you know, he has given us something new, this, the strength of these people. He's the bottom of Pull it again. The bottom. Yeah. Good night. In Moscow, the Soviet news agency TASS described Bobby Sands as a fighter for civil liberties and the Mays prison as a concentration camp. TASS said Sands had been condemned to death by the government's refusal to meet his demand for political status. British government's failure to even attempt to work for humanitarian resolution reflects the moral bankruptcy of their policies in Northern Ireland. It is my hope that the call of Bobby Sands' mother for nonviolence will be followed so that the British government can suffer the glare of a much deserved negative world reaction.
One of the grim features of Irish political history is that it often seems impelled by terrible events, by catastrophe down the centuries. The death of Sands cast a foreshadow of uncertainty and apprehension on the island. Was it one of those events that changed things utterly to adapt William Butler Yeats, speaking as he was of Easter 1916? Certainly power beyond the facts of some sort was going on some seductive mystique was once again being generated. That curious mystique of Irish Republicanism, physical force Irish Republicanism, I mean, one of the great strengths of Irish nationalism as a force is its, its brilliant ability to take the dead and reshape them as mythological characters. And so Bobby Sands, of course, through the funeral, which was an extraordinary event, it, it, he sucked immediately into this kind of mythological tradition and, and making it into something that's no longer individual but in fact has become timeless and, and historic and some kind of essence of what it means to be Irish. Until Bobby died, there was always the hope that the British would introduced some sort of reforms to end the, the, the hunger strike, but they didn't. And then it was simply a waiting game as we counted down through the rest of our comrades. Bobby Sands died a week ago and the British government did not relent. Do you believe that your brother's death will make any difference to their attitude? Hopefully, yes. But I would just like to say that Margaret Thatcher, the British government, has murdered my brother. They cannot break these men. They cannot force these men to accept criminal status. They will carry it through because there was another Republican hunger striker, Terence McSweeney, and he left the Republicans as saying, it is that not those who can inflict the most, but those who can suffer the most who will win in the end. Mr. Thatcher have realised that, terrible though it would be, the more people died, the worse it would get for the IRA. It didn't mean that she wanted more people to die, but she understood that the oddness of the hunger strike as a weapon was that it weakened with each death. The pressure comes on the people who are organising the striking, doesn't it? Why are we dying if we're not getting anything? She would think, what's the IRA doing that they want mother's sons to die? What about the families? And indeed, that became an issue in the, in the hunger strike.
Throughout the hunger strike, the prisoners in the maze rejected appeals to end their fasts. Papal envoys, priests, politicians, Red Cross delegations all came and went without changing the men's attitudes. The cracks began to show in the campaign, not inside the prison, but from outside. One by one, the prisoners reached a crucial stage of their fast. One by one, their families stepped in to stop them dying. Now let me make it absolutely clear, as I say a word about the hunger strike, no concessions have been made to the IRA and there will be no perpetration uh, of uh, anything which uh, looks like concessions uh, to those who commit violence. The real irony is that Bobby Sands, he saw himself as a soldier in the armed struggle of the IRA, yet winning that election had a really profound effect in terms of reshaping the whole idea of what Sinn Féin and the IRA could achieve, just through using the rhetoric, using the imagery that Bobby Sands had, had unleashed, but using it in a way which was persuasive to enough people that they would vote for you. of Bobby Sands came at a time when the American political class was sort of waking up to their responsibility. He forced us to recognize that there were plenty of people with whom we could work if we were willing to expend the political capital to solve this problem. You know, Bobby Sands, maybe he didn't even understand that something profound and good was just about to happen. It is what eventually led to the Good Friday Accords. There are turning points in modern Irish history. 1916 is a turning point. 1981, those 66 days of Bobby Sands' hunger strike are undoubtedly a turning point. Very cute. And history is a very twisted route, and the twist it took was a very unexpected and ironic one. Ultimately, Bobby Sands effectively marked the end of the tradition of armed struggle in Ireland because what he said was, there is really no justification and no need to kill people. What you really need to do is dramatize your own suffering. In a way, Bobby Sands did win. He, he's always going to be there in the consciousness of revolutionaries around the world. But in fact, he posed a really significant challenge to revolutionaries, because by reaching back into Irish history, into the notion that actually you win by enduring and not by inflicting suffering, he changed the nature of how people should think about how they might force political change. You win when you capture the public imagination. There's an inner thing in every man. Do you know this thing, my friend? 
It has withstood the blows of a million years and will do so to the end. It is found in every light of hope. It knows no bounds nor space. It has risen in red and black and white. It is there in every race. It lies in the hearts of heroes dead. It screams in tyrants' eyes. It has reached the peak of mountains high. It comes searing across the skies. It lights the dark of the prison cell. It thunders forth its might. It is the undauntable thought, my friend. The thought that says, I'm right. Thank you. 